people suffer unnecessarily. So, let's go back to those people in the distribution. I say the bottom 30% of the distribution isn't going to be able to get a degree at the University of Toronto. Um, unless they are, they are capable of working to an insane level, and even then, likely not. Um, so let's say that you have an ability-blind admission process. It's random. So everybody's name is thrown into a hat, and if they get pulled out, they get to go. Do you think that you're doing the people who are going to fail a service? Or not? You know, now you can make a case that you are, because it's likely that there will be a couple of individuals in the bottom part of the distribution who will make it through partly because of measurement error, right, because you're not going to measure this perfectly and partly because well, people are surprising and amazing creatures and you never know exactly what any given one of them is going to do but you're going to torture a lot of them to death at the same time you know, I've been struggling with this because I've developed tests that help employees, employers decide who might be competent more competent than who when they're hiring, and that's partly dependent on general cognitive ability. And we think, based on the statistics, the relevant statistics, that we can improve the probability that a given employee, employer, will hire an above average worker in a cognitively complex, um, for a cognitively complex job position from 50 50 to 75 25 or 80 20. It's quite a lot. But it's not, obviously, there's still, a, there's still a fair margin of error there, but you know, having half as many employees below average is definitely going to be of tremendous benefit to your company. Um, and you might say, well, that's unfair, because there's going to be measurement error too, and that's not the question. The question is, it, is, is, it, is it more unfair than to do it any other way? Well, you could use interviews, but Tall, good-looking, extroverted people tend to do much better on interviews than short, ugly, introverted people Especially if they're a little bit on the disagreeable side as well, because agreeable people also do better in interviews So, not only are they tremendously biased in all of those dimensions, they actually don't predict performance in the long run very well at all So actually, that means in the States, they're illegal, you know Although companies, lawyers haven't woken up to this fact yet, but you're mandated by law in the United States to use the most accurate, valid and reliable current means of hiring available. And interviews are not that, and neither are letters of recommendation, which are pretty much as bad. They're not so much biased, the letters of recommendation, they're just useless, because, you know, Except insofar as if you can't get anyone to write you a letter of recommendation at all Well, maybe that's an indication that you're, very, you're not very socially skilled Or that you don't have a very good social network or whatever So maybe, as a really blunt indicator of isolation You could derive some information out of letters of recommendation But as far as valid indicators of future performance They're just not valid at all It's partly why I hate writing them It's their... their, their they're also illegal, at least they, they are in the US, even though people don't understand that yet But I know the law, and I know the validity statistics, so... Um, and what you're required to do So then you might also ask... Um, so, the, so the other selection methods are also biased and unreliable You could say, well, you could hire someone based on their academic history But roughly, that's an index of intelligence and conscientiousness anyways, it's just not a very good one Especially because there's tremendous variability between schools So, if you have a, you know, a GPA of 4.0 from school X And this person has a GPA of 4.0 from school Y There's no reason at all to assume that those are comparable So, you can use grades, but that's full of measurement error So, that's not very good either So, you could guess That'll give you 50-50 in terms of your a probability of hiring someone who's above average versus below average But um, that doesn't seem to be a very intelligent way of going about it either Because, and here's, here's something to think about So, let's assume that there are ten people working And an inappropriate selection method places an incompetent manager above them So maybe the manager is less intelligent than the workers, that might be one possibility, or maybe the manager is less creative than the workers are, maybe the manager is less conscientious, or 
whatever, it doesn't matter, some dimension of competence is not well matched with the demands of the job, well then, one of the questions is, what exactly are you doing to the manager? Well, you're basically setting them up to fail, and a tremendous number of managers fail in the first two years of their, of their promotion, it's, it's well above 50%, and so, that's not so good for them, but then you're also dooming the ten people that they're supervising to a kind of horrible per, you know, perdition for the time it takes for everyone to calculate that the manager is actually failing and what that means generally is that the very highly qualified people in the worker pool will just leave because why would they put up with that? So then you might think, well is it unethical to select properly or is it ethical to select randomly or exactly how should you solve that problem? And the answer is, well, we do try to solve it because we use selection methods, but we usually use ones that aren't very accurate. It's funny, too, because I tried selling accurate selection tests to corporations for a very long period of time. And one of the things I learned is they didn't want them. That was mind-boggling to me, because the economic utility in hiring people who are competent compared to people who aren't is so high, it's absolutely mind-boggling, because the difference in productivity between people isn't even... It isn't normally distributed, it's Pareto distributed. Some people are staggeringly more productive than other people. So, tilting your selection criteria so that you pick from the more productive end of the distribution means incredibly powerful economic benefits for your company. But, um, at least when I was doing this to begin with, human resources people, who were usually the ones evaluating the tests, weren't necessarily the most competent people in the corporate environment, which is something that hasn't changed very much. They were very badly trained, and they believed that there were no differences between people that couldn't be eliminated with training, which is like, yeah, no, no, that's wrong. As anybody, if you have any sense at all, and you think about it for 15 or 20 seconds, you know that's the case. You know, I don't know what it was like in your school, but in the school I went to, which was way the hell up in northern Alberta, in the middle of no man's land, you know, there was at least... 15% of the students, I would say, it was probably higher, who were still functionally illiterate by the time they hit grade 10. Functional illiteracy being they had never read an entire book. And that's way more common than you think. Like, I don't know how common you think that is, but the stats basically indicate there's as many people with IQs of 85 and lower as there are people with IQs of 115 and higher. So, and I already said that the minimum IQ level of anybody in this room is likely to be something around 115. So, the person in this room who has the lowest general cognitive ability is smarter than 85% of the general population. At 85 and lower, which is, there's just as many people there as there is at 115 and higher, at 85 and lower, then you, you don't get literacy. So, people with IQs of 90 or less have a difficult time translating written words into action, so they can't really read instructions. 